Thanks, everyone. And I, my sincerest apologies for the delay. There's a few uh, technological and uh, past office issues. Um, but thank you for joining me today. It's much appreciated. I'm really glad to see all these happy faces on a cold day and all of you uh, interested in learning a little bit more about the book and about the people that are in it and, of course, a little bit about Newport's history. Um, uh, this is my first book and uh, I'm really excited that I've written a book and it's really happy. I'm gl glad that it's out finally after uh, about a year and a half working on it. Um, it was launched in November by Arcadia Publishing. As John said, they do um, uh, a Legendary Locals series on top of a number of other um, historical and nostalgic books um, about communities across the country. Um, it was a uh, very well timed for the holidays and for uh, Newport's 375th anniversary, which is uh, this year. Um, Arcadia reached out to me uh, February 2012. Um, I just want to give you a little background about the book, if that's okay, and then we'll launch into uh, the characters. Uh, they came to me, which was uh, an honor to write this book. Um, it fit into a template, as I mentioned, uh, and they said they had found me through my work at Newport Life magazine. Um, and I uh, thought, I guess, I, that I would be a good fit with my background there. And uh, Newport, of course, is ripe with history, uh, with characters, so it was an appropriate subject as well. Uh, they provided very minimal direction. Um, I had heard that Arcadia uh, had done so, so I knew that um, the challenge was on me to really be uh, the best writer and the best researcher and the best editor, I guess, that I could be. Um, they did, uh, I, rather, I had an editor uh, who I worked with who had standard, standard author guidelines, uh, including a page count, which was a uh, very strict 128 pages, word count restrictions <coughs> for each little caption you'll see inside, um, and size of the photos, the digital size. Uh, but everything else was really up to me. So identifying the legends to include, you'll see a few here, um, what page each person was on, all the layout, all that stuff, that was all up to me. Um, so I really also had to find all the information on the people, the, the details, the dates, um, as well as write everything, of course, but also locating and paying for all of the photos. Um, that was something that I didn't necessarily think that I would have to do, pay for all the photos. It was um, an added expense. Mm -hmm. Luckily, I have great relationships with a lot of local historical organizations. Um, John Hattendorf was great. To, I work with him. He's also in the book, so the, the Naval War College Museum was, was a great um, ally in this research as well. Um, and, uh, of course, working at Newport Life magazine, uh, being owned by the Newport Daily News, that's certainly an asset as well. So their archives run centuries, uh, so I had that access as well, which was free. Thank you very much. Um, so that was definitely uh, a help there. So I, w I got the assignment, I guess, in April 2002. And my deadline was this past June 2013, excuse me, 2012 to uh, 2013. Um, thank goodness it didn't take me 10 years. I may have lost my mind by then. Um, <laughs> So it took me a little bit more than a year to assemble. Uh, from the research to the actual interviews, I did interview as many uh, living people as I possibly could. Um, um, and then uh, uh, writing the little captions, uh, I'm not sure if you've actually seen a copy of the book or if you have copies, but they're all um, black and white historical photos with little uh, captions and, and uh, anecdotes here. So I did write each of, tho of those and send and email it to each of the people that I had interviewed to make sure that everything was accurate um, as far as facts, facts goes. Um, I also had heard that Arcadia did very little uh, fact checking as far as the, the information goes, so that responsibility was on me. So I had as many people read it as I possibly could that I felt knew what they were looking at, including my dad, including my editor at the magazine and the newspaper, a colleague at Cruising World magazine, so I really wanted to make sure I had uh, as many eyes on this as possible. Um, let's see, uh, it ended up being about 30,000 words, so I'm not quite sure if that's long or short or what, but given it's my first book, I guess that's now my, my level for, for standard. Um, many people have asked me uh, how the legends came to be legends and how I chose them and they came to be in this book. Uh, I don't pretend to be an expert in, in the people of this community. I just adore them and cover them all the time with my work at the magazine. Um, so it was terribly hard to pick who to go in this book. Um, I, I really uh, wanted to make sure that people in here were, were very deserving of this and they weren't um, all the people that you may have already heard of before. Um, I really tried to make it um, a, a, a new read for, for some people. Of course, there are a few recognizable faces and names in here. Um, and there are so many that I actually couldn't fit because of the 128 page word, uh, excuse me, page count. 
uh, which actually was very restrictive in the end. Um, one wouldn't have thought that that was restrictive, but it ended up being so, because there were many people who couldn't fit in. Uh, I did actually try, it's, I've got a funny story for you, which is totally a digression, but uh, I tried to include actor Van Johnson, who is a 1950s actor, you may be familiar with the name. Uh, I did try to include him, he was on my, my top 100 list of people to include. Um, I did include 100 people in the book, so that's why I mentioned that number. Um, but I went to MGM, who produced his movies, and they wanted to charge me somewhat something like $500 to reproduce uh, an image of the movie poster of one of his, his films. And, you know, given that this is my first book and I don't have a budget for it, I said, okay, thank you very much. I appreciate the offer, but that's a little bit too expensive for me. And so a couple of weeks ago, I get a random phone call from a woman who is a big Van Johnson fan, and uh, she's advocating um, this, this initiative to have a Van Johnson postage stamp. And she complained that I had done my, my research incorrectly, and I shouldn't have gone to MGM. I should have gone to her, and she would have brought all the images I needed for free. <laughs> and, um, and I just kind of thought that, well, OK, um, thank you for your, your support. Uh, maybe next time, maybe the next book will have Van Johnson in it if I can get a photo for free. Uh, but I just thought it was kind of funny that she was complaining that my research was, was shoddy. Anyway, um, not everybody approved of my selection apparently. Uh, but I really did uh, make a concerted effort to have a wide variety of people, uh, past and present, man and woman, uh, black and white, different industries and cultures and business and politics, uh, preservation and development, arts and public service. Those are a couple of the chapter titles of the book um, because uh, I felt they really represented Newport and its makeup of, of people. Uh, though the book did start with the founders, as you'll see here, Reverend Clark, um, and the Gilded Age, of course the Vanderbilts, we all know that name. Um, it was generally not chronologic and did feature uh, living people and not living people throughout the, the book. Um, but also, um, as a journalist, I was telling Anne this earlier today, um, it was really important for me to uh, interview these living people and meet them and, and hear their stories for myself um, and learn directly why they were legendary. Of course, I'd covered a lot of them and heard a lot of them um, through my work at the magazine and Daily News. Um, but I really wanted to meet them directly if I hadn't already and, and get to know them personally. Um, so that really ended up being the best part. Um, you know, that's how I got to see and meet Professor Hattendorf, who's in the book, um, and, and meet, interview him upstairs in his book field office and really um, meet these people in their comfort zones and their, in, their, uh, in their worlds. And um, that personal experience really influenced the writing. Um, let's see. Of course, uh, the next edition is going to be the challenge, because I guess I can define the people in this book as, as the low-hanging fruit, so to speak. They were rel to relatively easy to, to pick in here, and, and you'll recognize a few faces and say, of course, I know that person, and then maybe you learn a little bit more about their, their character or their history that you might not have known before. And then um, I really made an effort to, to reach out to, to new names and new faces so that people would learn a little bit about more about, about Newport people and the characters. Um, so, um, without further ado, I guess I started with, um, with Reverend John Clark. Um, you may be familiar with his name. His, uh, he was one of the founders of Newport in 1639, coming down from the Plymouth Bay Colony in 1638 to found Portsmouth with his group of settlers, including Anne Hutchinson. Um, he headed further south uh, to Newport, of course, and um, he, he, everyone, I mean, at least I think everyone is familiar with John Clark. Um, and just so I, kn so I know, if you guys have any questions, please feel free to interrupt me. I do have a little spiel here, but it doesn't mean you can't interrupt and say, hey, Annie, what do you mean about that? Please explain. Please go for it. Um, let's see. So four sets of brothers, actually family, was ended up being a huge part of my book. I didn't realize it going into it, but I look back on it, and there were quite a few, few sets of brothers as well as families that let, played a role in Newport and the book. Um, Oliver Hazard Perry... Uh, seen here, um, was known for his um, decisive victory on Lake Erie during the Battle of 1812, where he uh, switched ships mid-battle and uh, abandoned the destroyed Lawrence in favor of Niagara to defeat the British fleet. I'm not an expert in naval history. Perhaps I should get someone up here to explain more of naval history, but apparently that is something that has not been done before, at that point at least. And um, he... Uh, proclaimed to General uh, William Harrison, at the, who later became president, we have met the enemy and they are ours. So I'm sure that you are all familiar with that, with that statement. Um, he later ended up dying of yellow fever and was buried in Trinidad, only to be dug up twice and uh, finally laid to rest permanently in Newport. 
um, his brother, um, Matthew Calbraith Perry, also was responsible um, for a significant naval, um, naval stories. He negotiated the Treaty of Kanagawa in 1854, which uh, established trade and diplomatic relations with Japan, which had um, undergone centuries of, of um, isolation from trade, international trade. Uh, when he arrived, the Japanese were surprised by the Americans' black ships that were spewing smoke and uh, they didn't have any sails. Um, they were covered in, in black tar pitch. Um, so now, of course, Newport celebrates uh, the Black Ships Festival every July as a result. Uh, two other sets of brothers, or at least one for now, uh, the Vanderbilt brothers. This is Cornelius uh, II, um, and um, he actually built uh, the, the breakers. Uh, he was not to be outdone by his, um, let's see, this is the breakers. We all know the breakers. He wasn't to be outdone by his brother William, who uh, built the Marble House. We all know the Marble House as well. Uh, in 1892, it was a 39th birthday present for his wife, Alva, uh, who was a Newport and New York socialite, and actually ended up holding, uh, holding t suffragette tea parties in the mansion after she had divorced her first rich husband, William, and married her second rich husband, Oliver Hazard Perry Belmont, uh, and later redoing his Belcourt mansion down the street from her first mansion. Um, so Cornelius, I'm sorry, I'm skipping around a little bit here. Uh, Cornelius um, took over his grandfather's New York Central Railroad empire um, after his father and uh, was a little bit more pious than the rest of his family, who was all about wealth and, and uh, grandeur. Met his wife while teaching Sunday school in New York. And, um, and it, what Newport book is complete without the Vanderbilt? So I kind of, I, I almost had to put them in here. Uh, this is Alva. Um, I think she's fantastic. Um, this photo is of her in the late 1800s. She's got doves flying all over her and <laughs> what one of us wouldn't want to be in that picture right there with her. <laughs> um, let's see. Um, as I mentioned, the, the museum uh, and the college here had a, a, a nice presence in the book um, with familiar names to all of you. Alfred Thayer Mahan um, was, of course, the college's first president. Um, whose name I think graces this very building. Am I correct? This is the Mahan building? Am I? Someone's going to correct me. No, it's next door. Shoot. Okay, I was close. Um, anyway, uh, anyway, so uh, thanks to the, his progressive naval uh, thinking uh, about warfare and his copious Newport lectures, which were published, um, Professor John Hattendorf, which I mentioned before, is very helpful. Um, he's the museum's current director, also is featured. Um, there's, sorry, I forgot Mahan. There he is. Very dour fellow. Um, Hendorf is not so much. He's very friendly. Um, I'm not going to go into any more detail because we all know these characters and uh, you can read more about them in the book. Um, one, of, one of my favorite anecdotes actually uh, while researching people for this book came about while I was in search for um, Ida Lewis's gravestone. She uh, is Newport's darling heroine lighthouse keeper from the late 1800s. Died in 1911. Um, my husband and I went to the common burying ground on my birthday, which was last May, uh, to find her, her final resting place and her gravestone, and um, found, found it, of course, it's actually there, um, and her father's is out of the picture because it's so small and behind hers. Um, I ended up actually finding multiple generations of my own family. Um, a couple of, okay, my full name for full disclosure is Elizabeth Ann Sherman. Um, Annie is a nickname. So I ended up finding two Annie Shermans buried there, three Elizabeth Shermans, multiple Alberts and Edwards. Albert is my father and grandfather's name. Edward is my great uncle. So those names are uh, familiar Sherman names, um, all of whom I knew existed uh, through doing previous research. Um, but I didn't know they were actually all buried in, all together in this family plot. Um, dating back from the 1700s. Um, I had done research previously about Philip Sherman, who you'll read more about in the book as well. Sorry, yes, go ahead. Where is the cemetery? Please? The Common Burying Ground. It's not far from here. It's just on the corner of Van Zant and uh, Farewell Streets, oh, okay. right on the entrance into town. Oh, okay. And you can actually see her grave from the street, which I didn't realize beforehand. I could have just driven up, taken a picture, and driven away. Um, but uh, <laughs> So it's right kind of on the corner of Warner and, uh, and Farewell almost, next to that big red house. Um, okay, let's see. Um, so I mean, I had done research on my family um, and my, f my ancestor Philip Sherman came here in the 1600s and was part of the founding, founding families of Newport and was um, secretary to Governor Coddington, I think. Um, but given this familial connection to the city, um, 
obviously I thought that was pretty cool and thought it was uh, a, a great uh, background for me to both write the book and also to include in the introduction. So um, I thought that was unique that other books wouldn't, oh, at least I thought that other books like this wouldn't have that in here. So um, that's actually uh, included in the introduction, so um, you'll have a little sneak peek into that because I've just given the, the away the beginning. Um, let's see, so that's Ida Lewis, and um, the Ida Lewis Yacht Club is, is there. She's, um, I guess, inspired that, and that was where her lighthouse was, where that, where that Yacht Club is now. Annie? Yes? Just a quick addition. I've learned that members of the crew of the uh, buoy tender Ida Lewis pay respects on a regular basis. Oh, that's good to know. And the four posts around the grave mm -hmm. are modeled like lighthouses. I didn't know that. If you look at that. Let's go back. Oh, I didn't see it. Sorry. I cut it out. <laughs> Sorry. <coughs> That's why I didn't notice. Um, okay. So, um, wait a minute. Let me skip, to, skip ahead. Sorry. I'm out of order here. Um, another legend in the book that I really wanted to, to, to note was um, one of my favorite actual people in the book um, and also came about from a family connection that is a little bit lengthy but hopefully, hopefully you'll bear with me. Um, his name is Alfredo Sciarrata, uh, uh, World War II era Italian engineer and naval officer. Um, he actually made torpedo weaponry uh, in Italy um, for one of the first scientists to make such a thing. Uh, and then when Italy fell to the Allies uh, during the war, he and his team were smuggled to the United States by the Office of Strategic Services, which was the precursor to the CIA, if I'm correct there. Um, and they were brought to the naval, uh, naval base the, on Good Island, the torpedo station, um, to build um, torpedo devices there. They even had raised and brought with them two submarines and torpedoes, excuse me, one torpedo and two submarines, uh, sunk by the Germans in the Bay of Naples uh, so that um, they could use those uh, mechanisms and that research uh, in their Newport work here. Um, they didn't speak English, they're Italian uh, during World War II, they hadn't traveled before, they uh, took a long circuitous route through Africa and one of their ships sunk and they got here successfully not speaking English so of course they had to have an English tutor. She was pretty and her name was Marguerite, and he ended up marrying her. I don't have a picture of her, unfortunately. But uh, she, she, he ended up marrying her as she was a teacher at Rogers, and they had three wonderful children, one of whom I actually met during my research. Her name is Rita. She lives in Newport, has a condo in New York as well. And um, after his passing, uh, she took a, a kind of a clever, uh, circuitous route to, to finding some of his work, um, which looks like this. Um, he later became a silversmith after the war. Um, he stayed in Newport, had a uh, studio off Bellevue Avenue behind the Newport Art Museum where their um, uh, classrooms are. Um, he made trophies for the Kentucky Derby, vases for Cartier, a Shreve Crump and Lowe, and um, he made small bow, bo excuse me, bowls like this. It's just a little thing with a leaf design. Um, one of which ended up on my nightstand because um, it was a wedding gift and it now holds my wedding jewelry at night when I go to sleep. Um, my father knew of the bold creator. He knew the background of it. He knew who Sharada Sh was and I'm s talking to my dad who's publisher of the Daily News if uh, anyone didn't know, retired now. Um, he said, you gotta have Alfredo Sharada. And I said, dad, come on, who's, who's that? What are you talking about? Um, so he told me this story. He thought he was a prisoner of war. He was not, he actually went voluntarily. Um, and he made these wonderful silver trophies um, and, and bowls. Um, so my mother ended up finding Rita, giving me the information. I reached out to her, we met, we, we hung out, we had a great time, um, and am kind of per perpetually uh, impressed and inspired by the, the work that these, these folks have done and they're, and they're still continuing to make an impression on, on me for starters, and, and Newport, of course. Um, but any time, I should have brought it in, um, but any time you'll, you'll see something like this, it'll have a Shireda stamp on the bottom. And he tended to, not in this version, but um, have a, a silver S on the bottom, which ended up being the, the footing of the, of the bowl. Um, so let's see. Uh, that might be <laughs> the last person who is no longer living with us. I really tried hard to um, not write a book about dead people because I wanted it to be a living, living legacy. Um, 
uh, about Newport's present as much as, as its past. Um, so living legends were equally as important. Of course, um, when I m reached out to them, they're all like, what are you talking about? I, I shouldn't be in a book. Who are you? Well, this is ridiculous. Um, none of them thought they were doing anything very special. Uh, they, w they were very proud of their work and their accomplishments, and they, they met with me nonetheless. And um, I should go back to my family here. Um, my dad in the middle, Bucky, uh, my grandfather on the right, Albert Sr., and my uh, great uncle on the left, Ned. Um, they're, they've owned the, the, have owned the Newport Daily News since 1918 when my great grandfather bought it. Their story um, is included in here a little bit as well, and there's multiple generations in here, um, which reflect back to my um, my time searching for Ida Lewis in the in the in the grave in the um, in the cemetery. Um, and this, um, the reason they're included, not is just not because of the Daily News, but because um, they've been around since the 17th century. And uh, they used to own a, a William Sherman and Co. Dry Goods, which is had two locations, uh, based on different family members, and one of which was where the uh, the Brick Alley Pub building is right now, the restaurant. Um, and this, I believe, my father will probably correct me, is is that building. Um, but on the left, you'll see a few gentlemen. Um, one of which is my um, great great uncle um, and his family. Um, and you can read more about this exact photo uh, is in the book on page 73, I think, 74. Um, so if you have copies of it in front of you, you can uh, take a look. Um, let's see. Any questions while I'm taking a, a breather? Um, oh, thank you, yay. Um, so regular people like George Triplett, um, artists, athletes, educa educators, excuse me, were also a huge part of the book. Um, I really tried to make it about the regular, not common man, but the regular working man, the man who, the w and woman, excuse me, who um, really created Newport, their blood, sweat, and tears is in the very foundation of the city. George Triplett is one of them. Um, high school track star, people called him Flash because he was so fast. And uh, he actually ended up turning down a track scholarship at URI. Uh, he wouldn't tell me why. Um, but he uh, ended up working at um, Sears and Roebuck for two decades and uh, later was an influential educator, uh, was part of the local um, school committee for 16 years and, and the George Triplett Elementary School was named in his honor in 1985, I think, or 89. Um, he later uh, was a Pop Warner football coach and won the NAACP Role Model of the Year Award. So um, he's a super cool dude and whenever he sees you will always say, God bless. So he's a very... Um, very pious man and very, very, very strong at heart as well. Um, Paul Gaines, another one of my favorites. He is a character, um, always has a smile on his face, lives down the street from me. Um, also a little skeptical. When I first met him, he had no idea what I was talking about. Um, didn't know who I was, the, the book. And you just like, okay, I'll meet with you for a coffee. Sure, you're buying, whatever. Um, he really warmed right up to me um, when, we, when he started joking about his days as a radio dispatcher in the Korean War. And actually that was one of my first errors in the book. I hate, that was one of my first scariest notions was making something wrong. And he told me he had um, actually been in the Korean War, not World War II. So I, I made that, uh, that's, that's, that's an error on my fault, sorry. Um, uh, and, but he has of course more bittersweet memories of sitting in the back of the bus in 1950s uh, New Orleans before um, that fateful Rosa Parks incident on the bus um, a, f a few years later. Um, he later became a hardworking teacher at a number of local schools, a coach, and uh, made record books as the state's first black mayor. Um, I didn't bring a copy of the photo of him as a mayor, um, but he's, there's one in the book, so you can, you can take a look at it. He's got this huge big desk in front of him. Um, but he's still around. He and his wife, Joeva, she's on the school committee, and he's uh, really active in um, the Portsmouth uh, Black Regiment, who uh, has a monument out in Portsmouth, uh, right by Route 24. Um, Sita Bruzzi is uh, perhaps a little bit known, or better known, if you're a surfer. Um, this photo was taken in 98, back when he had a little bit more um, energy and less hair, I guess. Um, but he made a popular name for himself in the 1970s, actually 1971, when he uh, was arrested for breaking the city's uh, surfing ban, um, which at this point in, in, I guess, Newport's history, I think is kind of surprising given that, that surfing is such a popular sport around here. But there was a ban on surfing um, and he was surfing off, uh, off Ruggles, off Cliff Walk, and uh, he was arrested and saw a trial at the Newport Courthouse and um, 
it was later overturned and um, because he helped get that ban overturned, um, he was released and uh, he'll actually um, be included in the, or inducted, excuse me, into the East Coast Surfing Hall of Fame later this year. Um, he owns Water Brothers Surf Shop on that Memorial Boulevard. So um, as I mentioned before, families um, really are prominent um, from my own to the Vanderbilts and the Perrys, um, as well as modern family businesses. Um, father and son duo Fudd and Nick Benson, Fudd on the left, Nick on the right, are contributing, excuse me, continuing the dyeing stone carving trade in their early 18th century John Stevens shop on Thames Street. Um, though Fudd retired a number of years ago after buying the shop in 1927 from its first and only owner, John Stevens, um, Nick is actually continuing to do the stone carvings. Uh, you can see uh, uh, a gravestone there, and their hand on chisel on stone. It's nothing mechanized, no computers, no nothing. It's all, it's all done by hand, um, even the original lettering. Um, He's in the mean, meantime, Nick himself is earning uh, some impressive historic stone carving commissions like the National Gallery of Art, uh, the Kennedy and World War II memorials, among a few others, which are all included in the book, of course. Uh, and actually, stop on by the John Stevens shop on a Friday at 4 o'clock and they'll invite you in for a beer. They're usually sitting on the, on the patio. Um, another family w uh, that uh, I've known for a number of years uh, is the Nesbitt family. They, uh, Ilsa, you see here, she owns the Third and Elm Press. Uh, in the point, not far from here. Um, she was actually born in Germany, but came to uh, teach typography and art at the Rhode Island School of Design, marrying her husband Alexander uh, later and setting up the Third and Elm Press, as you can see here in 1965. Uh, the Third and Elm Press is still there, and she's still printing woodcuts, still cutting, doing cards and other artwork on this press, which is dated 1895, if I'm not mistaken. It still works. It's still a horse. That thing is incredible. Every little piece of paper she puts in manually. Uh, it's pretty, pretty incredible. Um, their home was adjacent to the studios. So it was all one building. So her two sons were raised with these raw materials all over the place. No TV and really no creative limits. Um, I've known her son Sandy for a number of years. He's a local photographer and he does some freelance work for the magazine. Um, so Sandy and her other son Rupert inherited the art gene. They kind of didn't have a choice. Um, he actually, uh, Sandy, owns uh, Blink Gallery on Thames Street, uh, excuse me, Spring Street. Um, and Rupert is an archaeological illustrator and art uh, reproducer in, in New York City. Um, so when I actually interviewed Ilsa and Sandy in their home, having known Sandy as long as I have, it finally made sense why he is the way he is. He's so creative and he can just make something out of nothing. He's just pulling all these raw materials out of, out of the corners and just whipping something out of nothing. Um, so it really made perfect sense why he is the way he is, why he's so crafty and creative. It's like he didn't have a choice. Um, so, sorry, that's Sandy um, in his gallery on, um, on, on Spring Street. And this photo he actually took for the magazine because Blink won uh, the Best of Newport Award a couple of years ago. So he took this photo for that, that spread. Um, and of course, I had to have some music in there. This one's kind of funky. I don't know if you recognize them. They're throwing muses. They were um, a huge band in the 1980s. They met at Cranston Calvert Elementary School. They were all uh, classmates together. Um, and they were, they, were, they were really big in the, in the 80s. Um, they went on to tour for, uh, for years, maybe two decades, in the UK, Europe, and Australia, New Zealand, of course, um, for 20, 25 years or so. Um, they still play together, um, though they all live in different parts of the world. Uh, Kristen Hirsch on the, on the left is living in New Orleans now. Um, Dave Narciso in the middle actually still lives in Newport with his wife Misty and they run a graphic design firm. And Bernard George on the right, I'm not quite sure where he is, but they still get together and perform every now and then. And uh, I believe this year or late last year they um, released a 25th anniversary retrospective compilation CD and book. So um, that's the plug for, for their, their work. If you like alternative 80s music, then perhaps that might be something that you can put on your to-do list. Yeah. So um, that's the end of the slideshow portion. I guess um, I wanted to leave time for our questions. If you guys have anything to ask that I didn't, that I didn't include. Yeah, go ahead. Why did you omit uh, J.T. O'Connell? J.T. O'Connell, he was on my list. I wanted to make sure I um, 
specifically JT and a few others, uh, Kate Lucy is a local photographer and friend of mine who had a couple of book, uh, photos in here. Sid Abruzzi's was one of them. She had done a, a book a number of years ago, uh, Born New Porters, and he was in that book. So I, I wanted to try to differentiate a little bit from her book and not compete too much with it. Um, but JT O'Connell was on my list and I tried to analyze as best I could. How did you I know she missed him? How did you know she missed did, him? Do you have a copy of the book? No. He might. How did you know that? Well, I listened carefully. And I <laughs> <laughs> you didn't mention 100 No, I didn't. There, you didn't mention 100 I only mentioned about 15 of them, yeah, but there, right. are, there are 100 people in the book. I did not include J.T. O'Connell, so he's well, he's a pretty guess. pretty good guess. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. Is Doris Stuck in the book? Doris is in the book, yes. Uh, she has a couple of pages. Um, she was one of my first picks as well. I work regularly with the Restoration Foundation. Um, and I, uh, a lecture I did previously, somebody asked me if I had included um, some not so savory stories about her that uh, had been publicized um, at the time. Uh, I did not include anything. I try to be positive in, in all of my work. And so I, I, this wasn't about rumors or, or negativity, really. I wanted to really be positive about people's work and their, and their lasting legacy. So I, I didn't include anything about a car accident. Yes, go ahead. Did you come across the name Cottrell in your, in your work? Uh, like in the I didn't. 1800s? I um, will start now, though. Can add that yeah. to my, I mean, I have a, li a list for the edition number two going um, with quite a few names already on it, so I'll add. They were involved in some of the uh, okay. ministries. That's great. In Newport and, and furniture. I do have a, 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 a couple of furniture makers, clock makers in there, um, Claggetts and Townsend Goddard's in there, um, but that could be a, a good one for the next one. Thank you. Cottrell. You know she's in there. She? Yep, she's the last one. Is there any, any true sports like golf, tennis, uh, polo, yachting? There's not, po there, there is there's a whole section on sports. So Sid was my one inclusion from, from the athletic side of things. Yachting, of course, is huge in this community. Tennis is huge. I didn't include uh, James Van Allen and the history um, and the historic members of the uh, Hall of Fame, James Gordon Bennett, and, and the story about his wonderful uh, polo pony friend, um, which my dad refutes, of course. But um, anyway, so I did include more athletics in the book. Yes. Yep. Yes. And you ignored the Navy. I did, yes. Not quite. I had, I had quite a lot of naval people in here, and I didn't realize I was doing it until the book came out. I'm like, oh my god, I'm doing a, a lecture at the Naval War College. I probably should put some naval people in here. <laughs> yes? I got to know JT quite well, and uh, later on I was talking to a college professor, mm -hmm. and I said, why don't you get JT to go in and uh, give your students a lecture? Yep. And he said, why would I do that? And he said, he's not even educated. Oh. <laughs> but he did well in business. He did very well in business. Very, I mean, I never got to know him, but he had a great name for himself and worked very hard. So there is no reason why he was not in this book other than what I explained previously. And if this book were twice the size, I um, perhaps wouldn't have had to cut so many people out. Of course, I wouldn't, but yes. What else? Uh, yes, Anne. Might have been John Howard Benson who bought the John Stephen shop rather than. Oh, his father. Yes, yes. Uh, you're right. Yep. Is George Ween covered the. Uh, yep. <laughs> I, we need to get you a copy of this. <laughs> so. <laughs> they are on sale here <laughs> today. They're downstairs in the bookstore. Downstairs in the bookstore. <laughs> Very reasonable price. Bef I did a few lectures before Christmas, and I told people that uh, they, uh, depending on how large your Christmas stocking was, it fit in the stocking. Mine's large, <laughs> <laughs> stretched to fit a few things. And they sold out at Barnes and Noble. Sold out before before Christmas. They were sold out at Barnes and Noble and Island Books, but they have since replenished, and uh, they did a second reprinting last week. What else? Yes, Are Peggy. You Absolutely. I will be here to sign if you have copies uh, and answer any further questions. <laughs> yeah. Is that it? You guys let me off easy. Are you sure? That's nothing. I thought you. Oh, there you go. Yes, Kate. Was there one person, or if you don't, if you don't want to, if you don't want to say, that's okay. But can you? Is there one person who you, who you found most interesting, or is there a story? My favorite was Alfredo Sharada, the Italian. Oh, oh, sorry. Yeah, no, that's okay. Um, he just because of the way his story came about, I didn't know anything about him to start. He wasn't on my list. 
um, my list being all the 10,000 people that could be in this book. Um, and then the, it was so organic the way it came about and I ended up learning most of the story about him through a story in Newport Life magazine 20 years ago that I didn't know actually existed so I didn't do my research properly but the story was right there and um, he was th just kind of the coolest the coolest character I really enjoyed meeting Paul Gaines because he, he was just such a funny funny guy um, but yeah a lot of a lot of the the that like I mentioned the, the the journalism background was really what inspired me to to meet these people and 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 learn their stories directly so I really wanted to um, have them see this and see that it's legitimate and real and I'm not just making this up and and that their stories will be kind of broadcast everywhere yeah Peggy the stone carver that was in the paper yesterday about that mystery stone yes I didn't see that story. Was it was it a Benson? Was it Fudd? Was it Fudd? Yep. Kennedy, he did up some project samples for the Kennedy family to choose from. So that's the same. It's the same family. Yep. Yep. Fudd is the gentleman in the photo. Mm -hmm. Anything else? All right. Thanks for coming, guys. I appreciate it.